we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. Look, let's be honest. There's a lot of Americans these days repeating Russian disinformation. And no, I'm not talking about the Hunter Biden laptop. That was actually real. And no, I'm not talking about Trump during the 2016 election. Uh, that was debunked. I am talking about what has been happening recently with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. My fellow Americans, left and right, are busy spreading whatever story or narrative they can to diminish support for Ukraine and elicit sympathy for Russia. Why? I don't know. Sometimes I think people just want to be contrarians for the sake of being a contrarian. Some on the left are genuinely Russian sympathizers. They always have been. Some believe so deeply in the philosophy of isolationism that they'll lie about world affairs just to diminish any chance of our involvement. For example, many have claimed that Russia had to invade because they discovered that the U.S. supported biolabs working on bioweapons. Now, this is a lie. It's been debunked multiple times. There are no weapons. And the Russians only started saying this after they read it on American Twitter. Others have claimed we shouldn't support Ukraine because of the Azov Battalion, which is a militia group with some of its members being neo-Nazis. Now, this is, is quite the statement because guess what? There's neo-Nazis everywhere. And so the implication is, is that if any organization or any country has any neo-Nazis in it, they do not deserve it of our support. But that's ridiculous. Um, and guess what, by the way? The Russians, the Russians supported DNR in the Donbass. Um, forces also wear neo-Nazi patches. That just came out today. Their denazification effort is apparently led by neo-Nazis. Turns out this is actually a thing in Eastern Europe, but it's also not a huge one. Now, recently, we've heard that the civilian genocide committed by the Russians as they retreated from Bucha was actually staged, that it was a false flag committed by Ukraine to elicit sympathy. I have heard the question asked, well, why would they do this? Don't they know that the media would be there right afterwards? Does that make sense to you? Of course, implying that it's not real. Well, let me tell you, that's exactly what a Westerner would ask, but that's not how a Russian thinks. In reality, they've killed millions over the course of the century, and modern Russian armies are no different. Look at Chechnya, look at Aleppo, read your history. And history tells us a lot, and that's what our guest today is all about. The Soviets would often blame the U.S. and NATO for exactly what they themselves were doing. Clearest example was when the Soviets started using chemical weapons in Afghanistan. And in the 80s, they created fantastical stories about how the U.S. funded bioweapons labs. Yeah, sound familiar? that were creating killer mosquitoes in a lab in Lahore, Pakistan. The Soviets also infiltrated the anti-nuclear and peace movement, steering it in a direction favorable to Soviets but harmful to the U.S. Even Reagan noted this at the time. They used witting and unwitting agents to spread their message. After the revelations of Russian atrocities in Bucha, where Ukrainian civilians were executed, some left where they were killed and others buried in mass graves, the Russians are claiming the Ukrainians killed their own people. To show the effectiveness of Russian active measures, labeling the Ukrainians as Nazis, some commentators in the West have on their own have gone further, claiming it was Ukrainian Azov Battalion that executed citizens in Bucha. Never mind, there's no evidence, no reason for this, or the fact that Azov operates hundreds of miles away. Others have used the Russian atrocities to indict the U.S. and the West for Iraq, Afghanistan, and anything else they can think of. Unfortunately for us, we have an expert, an author, who can shed some light on disinformation and the history of disinformation, which often takes the form of something called active measures. We'll get into what that is. So joining us today is Dr. Thomas Ridd. Is it Hi. Ridd? Yeah, Ridd, Ridd is Ridd. good. Hi. Great. Um, thanks for being with us, Thomas. Appreciate thanks it. For thanks for um, In 2020, you wrote a book called Active Measures, The Secret History of Disinformation and Political Warfare. And there's a lot of historic TTPs that we noted, um, which are TTPs, tactics, techniques, procedures, mm -hmm. uh, were highlighted, and they really jumped out at me. Um, in the context of the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine. So a little bit about Thomas's bio. He's a current professor at, of strategic studies at Johns Hopkins University, the School of Advanced International Studies, uh, recently named a Kluge Fellow at the Library of Congress. Congratulations. You. Uh, you were born and raised in southern Germany, studied at Humboldt University of Berlin, where you earned your PhD, um, spent time at multiple think tanks across the world, and... Um, 
like I said, a recent author of the Active Measure, Secret History of Disinformation, Political Warfare. All right, so. Now, let, now coming out in Russian and Chinese, by the way. Yeah, um, that's, no, that's a great, that, that's good. Um, but before I can, I want to ask you some basic questions, like what's an active measure, but it, actually I just want you to react to everything I just said. Sure. Um, so let me react to the one thing that you highlighted there about uh, the denazification narrative that we've seen used by Putin. So many times he said it in Macron's face, in the face of the French uh, president when, when they were talking in Moscow at that very long table, you may recall. And, you know, I, I, you just mentioned that I'm born in Germany. In fact, both of my grandparents fought in the, or at least served in the Wehrmacht uh, on the Eastern Front. And so the denazification narrative sort of has a personal uh, dimension for me and for many Europeans, including the French president. And, and I think it's just important to just state how absurd it is to anybody outside Russia and how much of an insult it was to any self-respecting European, any self-respecting German who had to deal with the fact that they you know, may be descendant of actual Nazis or other Europeans who had to fight are descendants of people who had to fight actual Nazis. And why do I mention this? Because we, we, we have this view that Putin is a brilliant... Uh, mind and, and influence. But here I think he really uh, shot himself in both knees um, because he unified Ukraine against uh, Russia by saying something that absurd, by calling their nationality into question, their history into question. And he unified Germany and all of Europe against Russia and made sure that weapon deliveries would be delivered as you know, fast as possible. So maybe that whole narrative that Russia is so shrewd and so good at, at disinformation, really, we need to question it, I think. I hope so. And look, I mean, a lot of the, the false narratives that I mentioned that are very that are popular on Twitter, they're not popular. Yeah. Okay, and there's a difference, right? Being popular on Twitter is not real life. Yeah. And, and so that, that's what makes me feel better. But I still, I still feel the need to call it out, right? Because some of these people will... will will outwardly critique me personally. They're like, oh, Dan, you just want to give money to Nazis. And it's like, what are you talking about? It, honestly, like, what are you, you get your facts straight. Um, and it, you can't let that stuff spread. Yeah. So there was a, 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 a an episode that I'm discussing in the book <clears throat> where the KGB, and this is Christmas 1959, funded uh, a global anti-Semitic hate campaign with uh, graveyards, desecrated and, and synagogues, um, daubs, you know, Nazis, uh, Jews out and swastikas on synagogues, mm -hmm. synagogues, including here in the U.S., including in New York, 15 different U.S. cities, and all, all across West Germany and Western Europe. So this campaign is fascinating because KGB did this. I literally spoke to a person who was part of the New York off, uh, resident tour who helped uh, a former KGB officer who helped uh, run this campaign. And it's fascinating because there was a grain of truth to it. There were still actual Nazis in Germany, you know, 14 years after the end of the war. So that's, I think, a core feature of, of many disinformation operations. That there's a grain of truth mm -hmm. somewhere, and they just Always. exacerbate it. Always. It's like the biolabs. Well, there are biolabs, and the U.S. has been involved. It just so happens that it's, it's very boring. It's, it's, it's your typical U.S. involvement in biolabs around the world, mostly meant to make sure that safety measures are implemented. And yeah. there's an ongoing, very public... Uh, very public partnership. Uh, there are some people who are neo-Nazi sympathizers in these Azov battalion militias. Mm -hmm. Again, you could say the same thing about about the U.S. Army. I bet you can find some. Should you defund the U.S. Army? No, that would be stupid. You know, and, and like, and, and these people don't answer the question. Well, what's the so what? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so we should just take Russia's side because we found some bad people in Ukraine. I mean, that's 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 very much propagandizing. Because it's not rational. It's not a rational conclusion to draw from the fact that you see something bad here, like you said, a grain of truth. Yeah, you know, I think the roots of this intense, very emotional debate about disinformation here in the United States, we have to go back to the 2016 election and the Russian interference in the 2016 election. Yeah. And, uh, well, that's what's so annoying is a lot of the people on the right making these claims were the complete opposite of it, and they were correct back then. Yeah. And so like, how, you can't, how can you hold both ideas in your head? So they, um, I think it's not that complicated. Russia attempted to interfere in 2016. Mm -hmm. They did so very crudely. Um, and I think I looked at the data very closely. I walked through them in the book. 
it's fa- I'm fairly confident when I say they were unsuccessful in shaping. Yeah, I, I agree. I've seen the data too, and you, you look at you look at engagements on Twitter and things like that, and you're like, and that that's my engagement over the course of a few weeks, yeah. just from one account. So yeah. you know, this isn't a whole lot. But let's let's make let's make an example. I just did this this morning in my disinformation class with my students. You may recall there was this there's this famous famous uh, Facebook ad that the Internet Research Agency in Saint Petersburg put out, and it, it's a, it shows Satan arm wrestling against Jesus, and the caption says something along the lines of "If Satan wins, uh, Clinton wins." Support mm-hmm. you know Trump in the campaign, mm-hmm. and. I think the picture is well known because a lot of people in Congress, in the House, on the uh, and Democrat controlled intelligence committee, paraded the picture. The High New York Times covered it. But if you actually dig into the data, pull it out from the from the uh, homepage of the committee and download the whole archive and then dig into the data, how many people saw that ad before the election? Mm-hmm. Not when it was shown, you know, to the public in 2018, but before the election. And the answer is. It received exactly 71 impressions and 14 clicks. Hmm. So I've never even heard of this particular picture. <laughs> completely ineffective, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, they, but, they, they, but they're like, this is proof. See, I mean, our election was stolen. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's, it's, it's ridiculous. That's what also makes me mad about, uh, and look, you know, people know where I stand on the election, um, but I'm consistent. <laughs> and I've, I've been consistent for years. The, the 2016 election was not stolen by the Russians, no. you know, and um, it, it frustrates me because the Democrats, you know, love to be very, uh, I would say very judgmental of Republicans in the 2020 election when they, in fact, were saying the exact same things in 2016. But look, I, I mean, I wrote this book um, as, a, as, as, a, as a German. I interviewed some former Stasi officers. I, I studied in Berlin, which was a... Very strange experience, I can tell you, to be like sitting in the living room of a former Stasi officer, uh, and he's very nice to you, offers you a nice cake and coffee, and is really mm-hmm. charming because you know they're <laughs> good at what they do. Have some cream with your with your coffee. Uh, that really reminds me of the scene from Inglorious Bastards. You're familiar with that? With the uh, scene I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah. It's 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 uh, man. What was that guy's name? He deserves he deserved an Oscar for that performance. But I mentioned the episode because. I think what's so tricky about this about this information, I was paranoid when I wrote that book that I could become a useful idiot myself mm-hmm. in one of two ways, either by overstating how effective Russian operations were, not just in 2016, but yeah. in history, yeah. or by understating how effective they were, because either way I would be uh, helping them ultimately. So I think the only solution here is to be, be as dispassionate and as fact-driven as you can possibly be. Well... Well, maybe let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about what it's like to to sit in a living room with the ex Stasi agent and what what did they tell you exactly? What what is what what which, what what really stuck out to you in this particular? I mean, paint a picture for us. Yeah, so Stasi had a unit that was specifically designed and made uh, for disinformation purposes called mm-hmm. Department Ten X in Roman letter and what just the X the Ten. And that unit was probably the most professional, simply the best disinformation actor in the entire Cold War. Mm-hmm. Why? Because they were German-speaking, like their target. They knew the jokes. They knew the, they could. They were listening, listening into German conversations that were very intimate, and they really got it. They, mm-hmm. they knew how to play their target. And this particular officer played a role in engineering the uh, uh, failed vote of no confidence, uh, vote of no confidence in the German Parliament of 1972 um, uh, against Willy Brandt. He survived the, that vote of no confidence because Stasi shaped the outcome of that vote successfully. Well, so, what tactics did they use back then? I mean, we know what uh, current Russian disinformation looks like. They create troll co- accounts. They do a number of things. What, what did it look like back then? In that particular case, uh, this officer, his name is Kopp, was running a an intermediary, a cutout who was a German journalist, Mm -hmm. uh, who was essentially uh, bribing a German conservative German member of parliament to uh, defect from his own uh, party and support the chancellor who was a liberal. So they wanted to keep the liberal, uh, the social democrat, in fact, uh, chancellor in in power. But the interesting thing here is that the Stasi ran this particular agent, this particular, uh, uh, the, the target didn't know that he was in fact supporting Stasi. The, the journalist or the member? The, both. In both. fact, also really? the journalist. They didn't, he didn't know that he was supporting the uh, Stasi, but instead thought he would help American interests. I see. And it's so they a, ran him out of false flag. I see. Did they claim that they were somebody else when they met with this person? Yeah, totally. I see. 
Um, so, I mean, it just sounds like really well-crafted intelligence operations to me. Um, yeah. Uh, you know. yeah. The, the, their tradecraft was very amazing, uh, yeah. very impressive. It always know? has been, yeah. yeah. They've been our number one competitor, uh, if you ask the CIA. So it, let's back up a second. Um, what are, what, how would you define active measures? Let, let's start at the beginning. Like I said, like I told the audience we would, but then I kind of, we veered off a little bit. Yeah. So in my book, uh, what, I, what, I, what I'm doing is I'm looking at intelligence, professional intelligence operations that, uh, that have, where the goal is to deceive the adversary or adversary societies somehow. Mm -hmm. But you have these instances where all the information that is, for example, leaked, is actually factually correct. These are sort of an edge case mm -hmm. situation. But the the Podesta leaks of uh, October uh, 06, uh, 16 of, uh, of October 16 are an example. There are no forgeries in the Podesta leaks as far as we know. So they're factually correct, but it was still a disinformation operation because it was launched under cover by mm -hmm. an intelligence agency, in this case via WikiLeaks. But we have cases like that in history. Um, so... I prefer the term active measures because it captures the whole point. Active meaning how so, what is activated. Mm -hmm. What's activated is an emotional reaction by the target. Yeah. So the goal is not to convince you of new facts. The goal is to make you believe in something that you already believe in even more strongly and to yeah. polarize you. Right. And the Russians are very good about doing that to our society in particular. You're kind of pulling this thread. Like the, bi the bio labs was a good example. The Russians didn't create that on their own. They're like, oh, what a great opportunity. We're seeing a trend on Twitter. Uh, why don't we just go ahead and confirm that? I mean, they, we make it very easy on them. Um, we make it easy with, with our divisions in America. It's very easy to, to, to rile people up. And, and again, I, I don't think they were very successful, as, as you noted. But... It, but Maybe they were because we've been arguing about it for years. Yeah, but that's a really tricky argument to make. Just because we, so why are we have we been arguing over you know the effectiveness of Russian interference mm -hmm. for years? It's because and uh, and I'm going to be sort of provocative here. To I'm not sure that you will be provoked by this, but people on the other end of the political spectrum will. A lot of people on the center left, not so much on the far left, but on the mm -hmm. center left believe that they have an emotional vested interest in believing that the Russian election interference was successful because that makes it easier for them to handle the fact that President Trump won the election. It's sort of easier to blame the Russians than to blame yourself, to be blunt. Yeah. And that, yep. that effect, I think, is, is very dangerous. If we read the available data in a way that is prejudiced, that we want to be true emotionally, and clearly you have the same emotion-driven analysis on both the left and the right, but it's dangerous either way. Um, I want to go into some, the history of this, right? And then, and then, then talk about how it applies to the modern day. Um, it was, it was also normal going back to the, to the portrayal of, of anyone who supports the West as, as being identified as Nazis. Um, th that's not new either. It, we talked about it a little, um, a little bit before, but um we're portraying West Germany as riddled with neo-Nazis. Um, the Soviets could, this is this, I'm quoting you now, the Soviets could weaken Bonn, alienate it from the French, the British and American allies and occupying authorities, delay or prevent German rearmament, paralyze the political debate and drive a wedge into NATO. Yeah, so uh, obviously the, 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 why is are Nazis, sometimes anti-Semitism, why are they, so, are they such powerful themes in, in the history of active measures mm. and they reappear again and, and again in different operations and yeah. many of them in my book i think the answer is because people are deeply traumatized by what happened um on both sides uh, obviously but also germans are traumatized by you know mm -hmm. perpetrating some of these extraordinary crimes in the in the, in the war uh, world war ii so trauma is what drives these operations and there's a there's an extraordinary czech operation for example that um, where the czechoslovak intelligence services um, uh, they dropped Nazi documents in a lake in Bohemia and then had them discovered by the press hmm. as Nazi documents that the actual Nazis dropped in the lake. Mm -hmm. Why? To, to drive the debate in the German parliament on war crimes, on Nazi war crimes, to prevent the German parliament, to get the German parliament to vote to extend the statute of limitations so that German war criminals wouldn't get away with it. And also that, so that they could continue to blackmail uh, former members of the German uh, government. Interesting. Uh, talk about how active measures took advantage of our own domestic peace movement. Um, I suppose throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s. 
know, you, you write, peace activists across the Western Hemisphere did not know that several well-resourced, highly creative intelligence agencies were trying to subvert, manipulate, and divide the international peace movement that these agencies believed their conspiracy was a success. Yeah. So back in, uh, in, in the late 70s and early 80s, in the context of NATO for, uh, nuclear force modernization, mm. it was a moment when um, the Soviets had an interest in keeping the status quo because they had already deployed the SS-20 uh, missiles and had a strategic uh, advantage with their missile uh, forces in Europe over the West. So they wanted to prevent NATO from modernizing its own forces and stationing Pershing uh, missiles and uh, Pershing-2 missiles and, and cruise missiles in Europe. So the, the goal for them was to use the peace movement to keep, to build up political pressure against NATO force modernization. Mm -hmm. And they did that by simply saying, we don't want new missiles in, in Europe. They didn't say, they didn't try to push the slogan, no missiles in Europe at all. They just said, no new missiles to freeze the status quo. And I think they, they, they aggressively pushed that, that line in the peace movement, in the nuclear freeze movement in the U.S., uh, for for many years, it's codenamed Operation Mars. Oper why, what is is that an acronym? Just Mars, like the War of uh, War. Oh, okay. Uh, one of the most viral videos on YouTube is with a Soviet defector. Um, I think the interview was in 1984. Uh, Major Stanislav Levchenko. Um, talk, talk to talk, talk to us about him. If the audience has not heard of this guy, look up the YouTube uh, video. It's fascinating. Um, so. We have something in the Cold War, we have a lot of defectors talking about active measures and mm -hmm. sharing their experiences in running active measures. We have even a defector in, um, uh, we have even archival accounts because although KGB archives never opened, we have Stasi archives contain KGB material, the Bulgarians especially, mm -hmm. um, contain, uh, state security archives contain a lot of KGB material. So we have a very rich set of sources, defectors as well as archival material so that we can really depict the art and craft and the evolution of active measures in the mm -hmm. Cold War. We don't have that today. I think that's a really important thing to understand. Today, we are often making assumptions about the Russian trade craft because we only see the output of it. Mm. And we are then led sometimes to assume a higher level of professionalism than, we can, than there really is. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, what their, their military's obviously <laughs> been, been very much overestimated, uh, which is good news and bad news, which is, Kind of, which is an interesting discussion in and of itself. I would, I guess, I'll, I'll I'll explain what I mean briefly, but I don't want to derail the conversation. It's it's good news because it's always good news when your adversaries suck at war. Okay, um, it's bad news, however, because that adversary now appears very weak. They know they appear very weak, and they have thousands of nuclear weapons. That's that's why it's bad, and it, it's changed the calculation somewhat with how we react to this. Yeah, I mean, I would go even further than that. I think some of the atrocities that we've seen uh, that, that are now coming out in Bucha, you mentioned it in your at the top of the of, of the segment. I think are, I would assume, probably also driven by uh, an army that is really uh, humiliated by defeat, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, frustrated, pissed off, and unprofessional at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and that's a scary thing. Um, it's a scary thing when your adversary is completely unpredictable. And this is, I think, what a lot of the Russian apologists in our own country don't realize. You're not dealing with a Western mind. I don't know how to make you understand that, but you're not. It's different. It's hard to explain how it's different, but it's clearly different. They think differently than you. So things that don't make sense to you, they don't make sense to you because you're a Westerner. Um, but it does make sense to, a, to someone of the Eastern mind. Um, speaking of... Uh, Let's go to some more mod. Well, you know, actually, I want, I want to stick with Levchenko for a second because we didn't explain to, to people like what he revealed. He revealed these, I just think is fascinating, um, these sort of phases of disinformation that the Soviets um, implemented uh, in, in the U.S., the sort of demoralization campaigns, like make you hate your own country. Yeah. And the reason I think it's so popular on YouTube, that, that video, that, yeah. that interview, is... is Am I talking about the right guy, by the way? It's the same guy? Yeah, I believe so. I think I, I'm talking about I the right guy. Think, I think uh, um, there are a couple of defectors. I think, uh, or am I thinking of a different yeah, YouTube I think video? Yeah, a different one. Bechev Bech 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 or something like that. Is that the one you mean? Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's different. Maybe it's like Yurov or something. And now, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe it is a different guy. Levchenko was a defector, though. And yeah. he also wrote about active measures, but I'm not sure of a, vid a video. There's a 1984 interview that's very famous um, where, we t where he talks about this uh, demoralization campaign. I think I know what you mean. But the problem with that particular interview, I don't know whether you want to cut this out or leave it in. Yeah. But, but the problem is 
defectors, some defectors are very credible um, and some defectors are less credible. Mm -hmm. So I tried in my book, I interviewed several defectors uh, who specifically worked on active measures. And the problem is, one, you're talking to professionals in disinformation. Mm -hmm. They tend to be very charming and very good at what they do. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be really careful and you know, independently fact check what they say against archival sources and also get them to reveal what they don't know. Right. For example, if, if, if somebody just is able to answer all your questions with confidence, you get a little more mm -hmm. uh, suspicious. But also, what, what he said rings very true, um, this demoralization campaign. We're going to make you hate your country. We're going to pull those threads, the weaknesses that we see in your free society where you question your founding, where you question liberal principles, and where you where we see people on the on, mostly on the left, I think in this case, mm. veering towards authoritarianism, you know, because they want to create utopia. Again, this is, I think, why there's Soviet there were Soviet sympathizers in the first place, because yeah. utopianism is a very powerful draw. Um, so anyway, whether he was honest or not, it certainly rings true, and it rings true today. It feels like sure, but but let's. I think that you're touching on a, on a really important point because we have. A history of defectors. There are a couple of well-known names. I think the most famous one is Golitsyn, who really led, led the CIA down into a wilderness of mirrors, is, is the famous term in this context, through J, uh, uh, James Jesus Angleton. And the this is sort of outside the active measures conversation. But I think we have to v b assess the credibility of Soviet defectors extremely carefully. And in this particular case, I would just I'm not sure. Just what was his name? Can I find his name? Yuri Bezmenov. Yeah, Bezmenov. Yuri Bezmenov. That sounds more familiar. Okay, is that yeah. is that what he th so? Yeah, so I, I I'm familiar with his uh, interview with his work, but his uh, uh, what he says doesn't check out against the archival material that I've seen. So I haven't. Even oh really? Read it. Yeah. Well, okay. So here, here's another question, uh, changing topics slightly. Um, I mean, what's the difference between active measures and what I'm used to in the military and intelligence community? I'm very familiar with how we do things. Mm. Um, what's the difference between that and what we call, you know, MISO, or it used to be called PSYOPs, which is a little bit more obvious for people. And this involves, yeah, I mean, spreading, not misinf, not lies, yeah. but our argument, right? Yeah. That, that's, that's, in the American context, that's usually what it means. Yeah. Um, we'll drop leaflets from airplanes onto, onto the public. Like, look, your government's lying to you. They should support, you know, like mm -hmm. that, that's, it's a part of warfare. Yeah. Information warfare is a very, it's a very serious part of war. It always has been. Um, and the CIA, they do covert action. Um, after a presidential finding, only the president can approve a covert action. Um, uh, that's actually, it ends up being a lot less sexy than than it sounds. <laughs> um, just like, I, I, I know how this business works. Um, it usually involves just, it, you know, and there's books written about this, so I'm not, I'm not going off any weird direction. It usually involves training um, a, a particular surrogate or surrogate force to do something for you yeah. um, or, or to engage in some kind of diplomacy on your behalf, some kind of informational warfare on your behalf. It's not always military-like, but that, that's, that's what, so everybody does it. To, to be clear, I think now, I, now, and, and, and I mean, what's your, what's your reaction to that? So I, when I what's started writing my book, I, I anticipated obviously that a lot of people would counter by saying, well, sure, the Soviets and the Russians are doing this, but aren't we just doing the same thing? There's a certain tendency to say, isn't there some equivalency here, perhaps even moral equivalency? And I know your question wasn't exactly on that, but it's related to the, your question. Yeah. I just think it's interesting to compare the two um, tactically. So what I did is I looked at CIA operations from the 1950s that are freshly declassified mm -hmm. and, in fact, telling some of these stories for the first time in that book. And what you see, if you look closely at the, at the evolution of CIA uh, covert action, is that they essentially start out very, fairly aggressive and quite um, um, confident and creative in the 50s, yeah. especially when it comes to deception, really mm -hmm. also... You can call it disinformation. They never called it disinformation themselves, but it was in effect the same. Yeah. Thing. But then Deception. start. Moderating. I mean, look at World War II. We put like inflatable tanks on, on beachheads to make them believe that the invasion was coming from somewhere else. It yeah. deception is a very common part of warfare. But the CIA did things like forging East German magazines at mm. scale uh, after the war in in the fifties yeah. until the early sixties. But then in the sixties, what you see is a. a, a, a they change the way CIA changes the way it, in, it, it engages in these kinds of large-scale deception operations, and they stop 
essentially lying um, at scale and perfecting the art of, mm. of disinformation. And I think, and the question is, why did they do that? Why did they really ultimately stop doing that almost completely, uh, at least when measured against mm -hmm. either the 50s or the KGB? And the answer is, I think, partly because there's more democratic accountability. Congress comes yeah. in, church committee, etc. And I think that's a good thing. It shows us that disinformation is ultimately an asymmetrical tool. Authoritarian regimes use it, not uh, democracies. Yeah, and I think that's right. I, I, I think if you ask um, current CIA agents, they'll say it's just not as effective. It, it's, not, it's, it's a risk-reward um, conversation oftentimes with... Because they're they're very uh, risk averse now compared to compared to how they used to be. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, it's harder to do intelligence operations these days in a, in a digital environment, yeah. um, where it's very easy to do counter uh, counter intelligence. But also think about it this way. I mean, I as a scholar, and I'm sure something similar may apply to you. When you get an intelligence assessment, re read an intelligence assessment from the U.S. Mm -hmm. intelligence community, I I take that extremely seriously. It's, it's really a, a valuable source mm -hmm. for me. If I knew that uh, the same agency that's doing this assessment that I take extremely seriously on a factual basis would also be building up that muscle as an institution to lie over, you know, systematically over time, I mean, would that undermine their credibility at home, ultimately? Yeah, yeah. Well, it does. I mean, look, the credibility has been undermined lately, not because of any of these foreign actions, but because of domestic actions. Uh, we don't need to get into that, but it's you know, in, in, in many cases it's well deserved that that undermining of a reputation. Um, you know that that's going to take some time to heal those wounds. I think, um, un unfortunately, Pe people think that there's a deep state and that they're they're politically biased, and and, and truthfully, that's happened. So you know it's, it 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 hurts the reputation. I don't think it's I don't think it's as widespread as some might believe, but they're certainly bad actors. Um, we've seen them. One uh, one thing I want to talk about too is the russian funding of climate energy and conservation ngos uh there's been links uncovered between russia and some u.s environmental activists this started when the u.s really um unleashed its fracking industry of course because that's a direct threat to russian dominance so what we've seen is russia funneling money to counter u.s energy and i like it's not just me saying this this is i mean hillary clinton's noted this uh, odni has noted this is a very serious discussion um, saw a lot of parallels when, in your book between what we're seeing now, because this is more recent, you know, this is in the yeah. last decade or so, um, and what they did in the 80s. And, and you know, the way the Russians do it now is they, they, they fund a, a, a foreign comp shell company called Klein Limited, which then gives money to a, a organization called Sea Change out of San Francisco, which then spreads money out to a lot of these NGOs, um, one of which we had in a hearing the other day and I asked him about it and he said, you know, it was very defensive. Did we haven't taken money from them in six years, but I'm like, you know, but you've got to bring this stuff up. There's, there's, there are parallels between some of these talking points and, and Russian objectives. And you know, how do we, how do we get to the truth? Yeah. I mean, I looked into this case a little bit. Uh, it's not something that I cover in detail in my book or indeed I haven't written like an investigative piece about it, but um, I'm not sure that the facts are as strongly aligned here in the in the uh, in the sea change case specifically in the United States and I understand that there's more Russian influence attempts in other countries when it comes to environmental mm -hmm. activism than here in the US and I think it really highlights this situation that I think is a point that is crucial it, you know we will encounter situations where a Russian operation um, aligns with our own political preferences mm -hmm. for example in this uh, environmental uh, group case uh, potentially for you I don't know. And I think it's absolutely crucial that we apply the same rigor in terms of being led by the sources, even if they come out with a finding that is not like what we hope to find. I, I had that many times in my book. I often started out with an assumption on a specific case that just didn't hold up. I had to self-correct many, many times. So I, I'm not sure we want to go deep into the details of the case right here, but I would just, I would just urge everybody to Keep an open mind and be ready to change your assessment of a specific operation. Because again, the risk, the risk is that we ascribe more power to the Russian government than they actually have. Yeah, it, and, and that's for sure true. Um, and, and on that note, I mean, that's, that's how we perhaps as a society try to counter some of these active measures. Because they're not going to stop. 
Um, they're, they're pretty persistent and it's very easy to do in the age of social media. And it's easy to find, as you called it, useful idiots um, who will repeat um, whatever nonsense is out there. And I, I'm always scratching my head. How do we get people to be better analytical thinkers, less emotional thinkers? So, you know, when you ask that question, what is really new in disinformation? It's really an uh, interesting question, actually. Hard question to ask, answer. And it seems to me that one thing is new and has very little historical precedent, and that is that we have made the conversation about disinformation has become highly politicized. I don't, I don't think we've had that. We've had that maybe during the Reagan administration briefly in the context mm -hmm. of the peace movement, but not to the same extent. Right. Intensity. The best counter argument against your domestic opponents are, well, what you're saying is Russian disinformation, yeah. which yeah. is, uh, to your point, it's kind of what I was implying with environmental groups. My, my real implication is a little bit more that um, we should be suspicious when these are the same thing. And also you're taking Russian money um, why are you taking Russian money? Maybe stop taking Russian money. Believe what you want to believe, but stop taking Russian money. You know, that's more our point, but... Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely, of course, yeah. Um, so, but yeah, that that, that, that disinformation about disinformation narrative is, I think, really pernicious today. And what we've yeah. seen is Russian entities and up to the president taking advantage of it and yeah. stoking that uh, polarized conversation about Russian disinformation because it makes them appear powerful, ultimately. And, and you know, one thing I tell people is y you've got to look at the facts in front of you and then start to assess what is likely and unlikely is if, if you, the inability to do that does lead down some, some strange, dark conspiracy rabbit holes. Um, you know, <laughs> you'd laugh at the conspiracies about me, right? Because there's like a grain of information somebody gets and they're like, well, clearly the conclusive evidence suggests that he is this. Mm. And you're like, how did you get there? Mm -hmm. How did you, how did you walk that path? My friend, how did you walk that cognitive path? It is interesting. It is. Um, but it, that's, that's what these people prey on is that, that inability to analyze, I think. And, and no, and of course, knowing that that preceding that are biases, um, political biases, cultural bias, whatever it may be. Yeah. You know, there's an, there are a couple of professions that are trained to enjoy the moment of being proven wrong if, if they're good at what they're doing. Investigative journalists, intelligence officers, law enforcement officers. Um, and, and I think it's just, it would be a nice thing if more people really appreciate to be proven wrong because ultimately it's that moment of uncomfort first, but then mm -hmm. you kind of feel proud that you're able to change your view. Yeah. And uh, not acknowledge that to yourself and to others. And, uh, and I think you ha we have to be able to do that because so many people are trying to get us to believe in what we already believe and just try to do so in a more emotional and more and less rational way. And it's just not a recipe for it. Yeah, it's a sign of a uh, mental strength, not weakness, if, if you're willing to change your mind. I mean, most, most people are not, of course, um, but because it hurts. I mean, it like hurts you almost physically. To, to admit wrong, be, being wrong on something. Um, when I talk to young people a lot, you know, asked if, if what they should believe in politics, how they should get involved. I always start out by saying, you know, to, maybe don't yet. Ask questions first, because you don't have a lot of life experience. You don't have a lot of foundations with which to assess the information placed in front of you. And you might become emotionally attached to a specific opinion that will then be debunked by somebody. Maybe by me. And then you'll be very mad at me <laughs> because, because you believed this and you'll hate me for, because, you know, and, and you'll, you'll label me as, 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 as your opposition. And it's, it's not useful. Um, it, it's not, it's not a healthy way to be. It's a little bit more healthier to stand back, ask some questions and then arrive at the conclusions as, as, as facts present themselves. Oh, absolutely. And I think we're really in a, in a, in a quite a scary moment if, because what Ukraine the war in Ukraine, I think, is just raising, raising the stakes of the whole active measures disinformation conversation. I, I saw this really disturbing picture just uh, yesterday evening when I was um, researching some, just checking some, 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 of my, some of my curated feeds from Ukraine. And, uh, and there was this picture of a, of, a, of a woman who had been raped and killed and somebody had carved a swastika on her back. Hmm. It's just absolutely revolting to to see this. And this is the result of disinformation working in, in the minds of some people who obviously are vulnerable, some of these Russian uh, soldiers who also don't know better, but, but the stakes are extremely high. If we have people in you know, Berlin, but also here 
trying to justify what Russia is doing right now, for ultimately for political reasons, because we've reached such a polarized uh, moment, that implicitly endorses a level of violence that I think should be utterly beyond the pale and unacceptable. Let, let, let's let's act, let's go into some detail on Ukraine Russia history just over the last decade, because this is what a lot of the apologists point to um, is. Uh, um, and a lot of it's from like Oliver Stone's documentary. Um, so may, may, maybe talk about that. What are, what their case is and you know, what, how, how that compares to the truth. Um, does, does that question make sense? Do I, do you want me to lay out a little yeah, bit more? Lay it out a little bit more. Uh, so, so, so the narrative goes something like this. The, the Euromaidan movement, um, was a U.S. backed coup in, in 2014, um, of course, I, I think in reality, it was Ukrainians, they want to be European, they don't want to be associated with Russia. That's largely true. It's, it's largely been an East-West kind of division in Ukraine, although I think recent elections would show that um, that's really not the case. And, and recent elections, by the way, I think have been verified by, by Western um, oversight. So... That's that's the truth, but versus the narrative, which is U.S. backed coup. Then they get these leaked Newland emails. Um, she was what the U.S. ambassador, which she was the what was her position, yeah, deputy, deputy under Secretary of State, talking to the U.S. ambassador. Um, I, I read through these emails. I don't see a whole lot there, except like, yeah, we should support this. But but that's very common diplomatic language. Of course, we should be outwardly supporting some. If we're not, we're not doing our jobs. That's my opinion of it. People have taken that. And, and construed that to be, construed that to discredit the entire, I guess, government um, over the last eight years in Ukraine um, and really justify Russia's belligerence and frustration, right? Just, you know, try, try, to, try to make the point that we would feel this way too if, if, if this has happened. But it, maybe go through that from your point of view. Well, that case, I mean, is fascinating uh, for a number of reasons. One of them also is because we know it was actually a Russian active measure. They intercepted the call between uh, Victoria Nuland and uh, mm. the um, uh, U.S. ambassador to Ukraine at the time and then leaked two different calls. In fact, one involved a European diplomat uh, mm. as well. Um, and that was, we don't know which intelligence agency did it, but it looks like an SVR operation, if you ask me. Um, I, I describe, uh, describe that in the book in detail. But I, I think the, the bigger point is, is, is fascinating. And the bigger point is that there is a certain part of the far left and the far right in the U.S. Mm -hmm. that has this anti-establishment streak yep. that really is, is very much assuming that the U.S. establishment, that the, you know, and NATO as well, have, the, have these extraordinary powers to shape events in other countries, right. like in this case in Ukraine. And and it's it's all it's a, you know it's a, it's a version of self hate that you see on the fringes of the political spectrum mm -hmm. here that blames problems both at home, uh, but really even in other countries on on somehow on the U.S. government. Yeah. I don't think this stands up in the face of uh, in the no. I mean, they never they never make a really solid case for it. They never really connect the dots in a serious way. It's just sort of this sort of haphazard bashing of the elites and. Yeah. And you know you see it all the time. I'm, I'm I'm more used to seeing it from liberal professors at elite universities uh, than I am the right. But recently on on Twitter, I, I certainly see it on the right as well. Um, and it's it's concerning. It's strange. It is like this sort of self hatred. Again, I, as I said in the beginning of this episode, I think a lot of it's just being contrarian for contrarian's sake. At a very base level, um, it, it might be that. Uh, but they, there's certainly a belief of this this ultimate power in government that doesn't actually exist. And you know, for those of us who have had the top secret compartmentalized clearances, and I see what NSA sees, they just they don't see what you think they see. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're, I, I tell people all the time, you're, you'd be much more concerned if you realized what the U.S. government wasn't doing that they should be doing. <laughs> that's that's when, I'm, when it comes to national security. There's a lot we're not doing that we should be doing. Um, you'd be much more surprised by that. Uh, yeah, uh, of course. But I mean, you know, it has become so easy to access some of these conspiracy theories. It's just they're just a Google search away, and then you can start going down the rabbit hole, and you will find people th that you you know suddenly you become part of a community, and before you before you know, you believe in some really out there conspiracy theories just because people around you are nice. And of course, the pandemic has exacerbated that tendency because we've all been stuck at home online. How, how did um, how did Russia 
prep the battle space. It's a, it's a U.S. term, a U.S. military term that we use. You know, we're always doing preparation of the environment. We're preparing the battle space. And part of that is information warfare. How did they do that over the last few years? Could we have seen this coming if we've been paying better attention? Um, we've, uh, yeah, some, some uh, observers have actually seen, seen some of it coming. They've started really escalating in, um, in Ukraine in 2013, late 2013, early 2014. Mm -hmm. we've, seen, we've seen lots of fake personas, fake uh, internet, uh, internet accounts. We've seen a bunch of leaks coming out, also with forgeries slipped in. There's an operation that involved uh, targeting the U.S. Embassy, especially uh, military attaches in Kiev, in 2014, with fake leaks, I mean, GRU especially has been has been ramping up this this uh, type of prepping the battle space battle space for years, as has IRA, the Internet Research Agency. But I would just point out two really important things here. One, they've never really cooperated closely. One, the IRA was always very unprofessional, very improvised, and GRU, of course, as an intelligence agency, more secretive and more professional. Although even they have made so many mistakes over the years that I'm not sure we can still call them professional, at least in that line of their work. And the problem, I, I think, is that we, again, this is 2016 is the key moment, we overstate how good they are again and again. I was watching some of the 2016 interference extremely closely because I was tracking a Russian operation. It was, I think it was one of the first people on record, literally a day after the first leak, blaming this on GRU. Mm -hmm. Felt very lonely back in the day because uh, mm. nobody else had backed up that claim yet. And why was it possible for people like me, for an academic in London, to spot so quickly that it was a GRU operation? Because it was so unprofessional. Mm. It was, it made so many OPSEC mistakes, you couldn't believe it. And, and yet we ascribe such you know, shrewd uh, tradecraft to them because we... Uh, for a number of different reasons, but it's just quite frustrating for some. What, what kind of opsec mistakes? Like they, it was easy to trace their their IP address. I mean, what was the? I mean, just one of many they used in the in one of the implants. Uh, you know that they used in the DNC. Mm -hmm. um, they used the same command and control IP address that they had used for an attack mm -hmm. against the German Parliament. Oh, really? Uh, year before. Yeah, that is that does seem like a rookie mistake. Yeah, <laughs> and so many like in the wiki in the Podesta leaks, for example, mm -hmm. they revealed the email that they used to fish John Podesta. And mm -hmm. that email contained indicators of compromises, the technical term, that allowed researchers to pivot and actually confirm the attribution with high confidence that it was yeah. GRU. I mean, things like that. Yeah. Um, what about the Chinese? How, how, should we, how should we think about Chinese disinformation? Are they, uh, is, this, is this an area that you studied extensively, what we should be on the lookout for? Because, you know... Uh, they're much bigger, they have much more money, and uh, they're growing rapidly, and they don't like us either. Yeah, the, the, it's interesting because China, the Chinese information operations, active measures, if you want to use that term here, although the Chinese don't appear to use it themselves, they're very different from what we see from Russia. Um, China has been hacking very prolifically, especially in terms of industrial espionage, but we haven't seen these digital disinformation operations against Western targets. We've seen them in Hong Kong, seen them in uh, Taiwan, seen them to a degree against dissident uh, diaspora groups, and of course against uh, Tibet, uh, Tibet, Tibetan activists. But for some reason, they're still more reluctant to deploy some of that against Western targets. But they use other forms of influence in the West, obviously. Yeah, it's almost, it's almost more blatant, right? It's money, it's, it's, it's market share, it's, it's things like that. I mean, they're just very blatant about it. It's, 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 it's hard to call it. It certainly isn't covert. It certainly isn't under the table. It's just um, trying to spread a narrative. Uh, is it something we should be worried about? Is there is there anything we should be on the lookout for? Uh, yeah, I think we should be absolutely on, uh, worried about China learning lessons from Russia about what to do and what not to do, both in the conventional but also obviously mm -hmm. in the info, info op space. Because Russia made so many mistakes, it probably is helpful for China not to make the same mistakes right. as well. And uh, And yeah, as Russia is... As Russia's economy is going to shrink, which is already happening, uh, China will become the prime player in this context. And as we've seen, just to loop back to, again, what you said at the top, the bio weapon, bio weapons uh, labs in Ukraine narrative was pushed very aggressively by the Chinese foreign ministry. Mm. Of course, in, for them, it was a reaction to right. COVID. Everybody uh, blaming them for COVID. So, um, and deservedly. So, of course, yeah, that makes sense. That 
What do you think about the, um, I guess, the, the current status of authoritarianism? Because it does seem to be a disadvantage in, in, in certain cases. Um, Putin seems to be very isolated. This is the reports that, that we're seeing. You know, I don't know what's true and what's not about what really what's going on. I'm curious what your, your thoughts are. Um, but is this a case where people are so afraid to tell the authoritarian, the dictator, the truth that they end up making some very poor decisions? Um, and will China run into that same trap? I mean, Russia, the, the way if we can uh, believe the intelligence disclosures that we've seen about what's going on inside Moscow and the Kremlin, it's already the case that I think uh, Putin has a very skewed perception of reality. I'm mm -hmm. not sure he fully appreciates, for example, what's happened, what happened in, Bu in Bucha as mm -hmm. a, uh, because he, he's probably not getting briefed on it. Yeah. So, but the bigger point I think that bears uh, just emphasizing is what Russia did in, in Ukraine, what Russia did in Bucha is so beyond the pale, so horrible, that I hope we can resist the temptation, we in the United States, but also in Europe, to polarize to, to 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 inject what happened in ukraine in the in the political mill and polarize our views on 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 russia because that has happened for more than five years now it was very counterproductive yeah let's really move on right and and i think the people who took who sympathize with russia are so eager to be right that maybe that's that's the motivation behind some of this these nonsensical narratives that i've noted um the, this the desire to be right is very very strong you know, see, we, 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 they weren't really the bad guys you thought they were. They want to they say that so badly. See, see, I was right. And I think that's, that's driving a lot of this, but you're right. You've got to resist it. It's, it's, it's rare in history that it's, it's so clear who the good guys and the bad guys are. Oh. Um, and it's pretty clear here. I mean, <laughs> I mean yeah, one president is literally the voice of Paddington Bear in Ukrainian, and the other one is poisoning his enemies with radioactive uh, right. uh, material. And has been for a long, long time. Um, and if you're not convinced after that conversation, I, I don't know what will convince you. Um, but thanks for listening and give this five stars. Uh, Thomas, where can people follow you? Uh, I'm on Twitter at R-I-D-T, R-I-D-T, and uh, my book is Active Measures. Great. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me.